So today we're talking about the endocrine system. This is kind of a short system, just a review of more of the complex components of the endocrine system. Remember, you finished off with this in general A&P, right? You talked about all the glands in lab, their functions, what secreted them. So we're not going to go into that detail again. Let's assume that you went over that basic knowledge. Now we're going to go over kind of the advanced functioning of the endocrine system. So these are all the glands of the endocrine system, if you remember. One of these is actually also part of the nervous system. And which one in this list is actually part of the nervous system? The hypothalamus. Yeah, the hypothalamus is just such a boss for the human body and homeostasis because it's in charge of the endocrine system. It's also in charge of the autonomic nervous system. Do you remember that? It's sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. It regulates our thirst. It's constantly sampling the body and deciding do we need to adjust with some hormone release or hormone inhibition, depending on what's going on in the body. So the hypothalamus is just essential for homeostasis. And we're going to study how it influences the endocrine system. So the pituitary gland is kind of the partner in crime of the hypothalamus and the endocrine system. The two work very closely together. But remember, there's two parts of the posterior. There's the anterior pituitary and the posterior pituitary. And we'll talk about that. So we have the thyroid gland that controls metabolism, the parathyroid gland that controls calcium balance, um, the thymus that helps with immune development. So this is active during childhood, and it turns to fat in adults. It's found on top of the heart. The adrenal glands, those are in charge of, well, there's two parts. There's an inner portion called the adrenal medulla that secretes epinephrine or norepinephrine for the stress response. And then there's the outer part of the adrenal gland that secretes cortisol and all those glucocorticoids that are in charge of long-term stress control. And we'll talk a little bit about that. The pancreas, we know, secretes um, insulin and glucagon for controlling what in our blood? Blood sugar, blood sugar. Glucagon raises blood sugar, so it stimulates that, what would it be, glycogenolysis, right? Stimulates the breakdown of glycogen to release glucose to our blood. And insulin lowers blood sugar. And the gonads, ovaries, and testes, we know progesterone, estrogen from the ovaries, and the testes make... Uh, testosterone. There's other hormones that are also produced by other organs that aren't listed here. For example, fat cells. Fat cells secrete estrogen, and that's something that people don't know about. But when, for example, when males acquire too much body fat, especially after the midlife <coughs> period, when men enter their 50s and 60s and they develop a lot of body fat, they can get what we call man boobs, right? And that is the excess estrogen that actually deposits over and, you know, can create that kind of low muscle tone, flabby look of men with too much estrogen. And females that are overweight have excess estrogen, and that impairs fertility. So women that are overweight have a harder time having children because of increased estrogen. And we also know that one of the most common forms of breast cancer is estrogen binding cancer cells. So they're breast cells that bind estrogen and develop into cancer. So some people that have breast cancer, one of the treatments for it is they'll do a lumpectomy, remove the small lump, and then they'll have to take a pill for five years that blocks the effects of estrogen. So it blocks estrogen secretion so they don't feed that cancer. So it's really important that we think about our estrogen levels as females by controlling our body fat. And also, some of the things we um, take in in the environment and in our diet affects estrogen. For example, plastic bottles. You know if you leave plastic bottles in the heat in your car, what happens to them? There's xenoestrogens, which they act like estrogen, but it's in the plastic. It actually leaches into the water, and then you drink that water, and that's excess artificial estrogens, and that is linked to breast cancer for people that are at risk. So we really have to avoid that, you know, the crunchy plastic bottle like I see some here in class. And that's fine as long as you keep them cold, and, they're not, and you don't have to worry about that now. It's winter out, right? But if it's in the summertime and it's sitting in the back of your car in your trunk, you buy a big case and you leave it there, not a good, not a good thing, not healthy. So those are called xenoestrogens. Xeno means like foreign made. There's phytoestrogens. There's certain things that we can take in our diet that contain estrogen. And 
who do you think should look for extra estrogen who might want to eat these foods that contain estrogen-like compounds? Women in what stage of life? Menopause or perimenopause. Some people actually boost their estrogen consumption during that time, not by drinking plastic bottle estrogen, <laughs> but um, soybeans. You've heard of soy milk, right? And they've, instead of saying soybeans, sounds really boring, right? Now we call them edamame, right? Um, that's just soybeans, basically. So um, you can make soybean salads, and they're kind of tasty. I have them myself. I enjoy them. And they have found that they decrease the symptoms of menopause, like hot flashes and all that kind of stuff, people that increase their soy consumption, their soybean consumption, you know, during that time of life. So, but younger women have to be careful and not getting too much estrogen because your ovaries are producing all that you need. Okay. Um, oh, one other thing I want to mention about uh, two other hormones, and that is leptin and ghrelin. G-R-E-H-L-I-N, leptin and ghrelin, those are hormones that are, this is fat cells, so we could add to the side here, you know, fat cells, they're troublemakers, right? They not only just make us uncomfortable when we have too much on board, but also they secrete these hormones, um, some of which can, which can be problematic. So leptin is the, um, the hormone that stimulates I'm full. It's the I'm full hormone. And ghrelin, or ghrelin, however it's pronounced, G-R-E-H-L-I-N, ghrelin, is the I'm hungry hormone. So if a person has, so I'm going to leave it at that, actually. We're going to talk about a concept of um, upregulation and downregulation um, that will speak to those two concepts. So let's just leave it at that. Okay. So. That's the endocrine system, just in an overview. So it works with the nervous system to coordinate and integrate the activity of our body cells. So endocrine system and autonomic nervous system really are in control of that involuntary homeostasis. Yes? Fat cells, fat cells. Yep, so fat cells, I said maybe add that off to the side. Adipose cells, because these are all different glands, right? So adipose cells also secrete leptin, ghrelin, and estrogen. <clears throat> okay, so it acts with the nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, to control homeostasis. But hormones are what the endocrine is in charge of, and they're transported in the blood. And because of that, the responses are slower and longer lasting than the nervous system because action potentials in the nervous system are very quick. We get rapid responses with an autonomic nervous system. But responses from hormones take a little while. And it also takes a little while for them to go away, too. So if you have, like, epinephrine secretion, you have quick secretion because it comes from the nervous system. It's a neural stimulation that causes release of epinephrine, but once it hits the blood and binds to all your body cells, it takes a while for those effects to go away. So like if someone just popped their head in the door, someone who passed away maybe in your childhood and they popped their head in the door and said, hey, have a good class, you'd be like, Ugh, right? Your, ep your sympathetic nervous system would be on overdrive. And then it takes a while for that to calm down. Your heart rate and that stressed out feeling, right? takes a while because we need to break these hormones down over time. Some are processed by the liver, some are processed by the kidney. So if a person has kidney disease, what can we say about their ability to cope with stress like epinephrine? It's going to take a while for that epinephrine to break down if they have kidney disease. So it's really important that we create an environment when people are in our care that isn't stressful. And what's the number one cause of stress in the hospital environment? has nothing to do with us. What did you say? No. <laughs> Not talking about the staff or the, the, the students, but the patient. What's the number one cause of stress? No. No. That's no stress. Once you're dead, stress is <laughs> impending. Yeah. No. Most common, most common cause of stress. There's a lot of people that are getting poked every day with heparin and insulin, and they don't care. No, there's a lot of people that are just, they don't want to leave the hospital, actually, you know. 
pain, pain is the number one. Isn't what that, what brings people to the hospital? The number one thing that brings people to the ER is pain, right? So can we control pain as nurses? To a point, definitely. We can bring it down to a tolerable level or something that they can cope with. If someone tells you that, oh, uh, so-and-so is on all the pain reliever they need, don't worry, don't even bother calling the doctor because they're not going to give you anything. I say, unacceptable. That is not good nursing care. We don't just say, oh, you're in pain, sorry. We don't do that. There are other options for pain relief that we can offer patients. Sometimes it's just ice. I've had patients sometimes that have maxed out and everything else and you give them a warm, uh, like a heating pad, or it's like a water-filled thing at Gunderson, or um, a cool pack, and it instantly takes that edge off. That wasn't so hard. We just gotta try and not just say, oh, sorry, you're in pain. I've had patients like crying when I pick them up for a night shift sometimes, because you know how pain gets worse at night. They're just in tears, and I'm like, this is unacceptable. Call the doctor, and the doctor's like, oh, okay, let me do some checking, and I'll put some orders in. And bam, they put some orders in, they adjust something. Next thing you know, you go and look at that patient, and they're sleeping. That wasn't so hard, right? So never um, take pain as something that you can't help with. You're not going to make it go away, but you can definitely bring it down to a level that's tolerable. Okay, so they're much longer lasting. So we have to treat pain so our patients don't get stressed and release epinephrine and have that circulating in their blood. So endocrinology is the study of the endocrine system. So there's different types of glands in the body. So when you hear the word gland, I want you to know the difference. Exocrine glands are not secreting their stuff to the bloodstream. So my salivary gland secretes saliva to my mouth. And there's little ducts, the salivary duct, that takes it to my mouth. So we don't see this going to the blood. The pancreas is an endocrine organ, but it also makes digestive enzymes. And those enzymes don't go to the blood. They go to the pancreatic duct, which goes to the, do you remember from the digestive system last year? What do those pancreatic enzymes go to? They go down the pancreatic duct to the duodenum or small intestine, and that's where they do their job, okay? So that's ducts. Um, sweat, sweat glands, remember in the skin, you looked at those in the skin, those little clusters of, they look like um, little donuts with sprinkles on them. They have ducts that go to the surface, the, uh, surface of the skin, not to the blood. So the endocrine system is a ductless system, does not have ducts. The cells are, 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 are surrounded by capillaries and they release their hormones to the capillary bed that serves that endocrine gland and then it carries it off to the rest of the bloodstream. So it's all about the blood. So something is a hormone if it comes from an endocrine gland and goes to the blood. Now we have things that come from the brain that go to the blood, but those are neurotransmitters because the brain itself is not a endocrine organ. So um, the hypothalamus we call a neuroendocrine organ because it is part nervous tissue and it also controls the endocrine system. So it secretes hormones. The hypothalamus makes hormones. So it's also an endocrine gland, but it's made up of ner nervous tissue. Some glands have exocrine. Now, we just said exocrine means it goes to, to ducts, not to the blood, right? So we already said the pancreas is an exocrine gland because it secretes digestive enzymes to the pancreatic duct. The gonads secrete hormones that act locally to develop sperm and to develop the follicle for releasing that egg. So they act locally as well as system-wide. So when those hormones go system-wide, it's what makes men men and women women, right? Those characteristics of the, those genders, but they also act locally in the environment. Same thing with the placenta. The placenta can release hormones to the blood, and it also releases hormones locally to the uterus to support that developing fetus. So those are exocrine and endocrine organs. And like I said, other tissues that produce hormones, we're not going to go into the details of all of these, but um, the stomach releases gastrin. You don't have to write these down. We'll talk about these more in detail. That's why I introduced the endocrine system so early in the semester because we're going to talk about all these in the different systems. Small intestine releases things like cola, uh, um, oh my gosh, I'm having a brain block. 
a number of digestive hormones, cholecystokinin, um, um, histamine, I believe, um, endro, I can't think of the other one, I'm having a brain block, but a number of them, you don't have to write them down. Erythropoietin, remember that? The kidneys secrete that to help, what, increase red blood cell production so we can deal with low oxygen environments. The heart secretes, the atrial walls of the heart secrete atrial natriuretic peptide to control high blood pressure. So thymosin from the thymus to develop uh, our immune cells. So we'll get into some of those. So two main classes of hormones. We need to talk about their chemical structure because how the body deals with them is a little different depending on their chemical structure. So amino acid-based hormones are just made up of amino acids and they become shorter chains of amino acids we call peptides. And if they're really long chains, which have um, a lot of chemical interactions, gives them a specific shape, we call those um, proteins. So some are proteins, some are peptides, but regardless, they're just long chains of amino acids. The key thing to know here that you should add is that they are water-soluble. Amino acid proteins are water-soluble, which means they're charged. And remember, our plasma membranes of our cells have a fatty core. So amino acid proteins cannot diffuse right into our cells. They need a protein carrier. They need to bind to something on the surface of our cells that opens up the door and lets them in through that fatty core. Steroids are made from cholesterol, which is a fat, that's a lipid. Those can diffuse right across. So they don't need a protein to bind to on the plasma membrane. They just diffuse right into the cell and do their job. And we're going to go into the details of how they do that. So, there's a lot of protein-based, amino acid-based hormones in the body. So I'm not going to list those all, but I am going to list the steroid ones so you know the difference. So the fatty hormones that you're most familiar with, maybe some you're not, are estrogen, testosterone, and you can abbreviate because you know what these hormones are. You've heard of them. Progesterone, thyroid hormone, which is called T3 and T4. T4 is what the thyroid actually produces, and then that is converted to T3 in the tissues. Cortisol, which is our long-term stress hormone. You've heard of hydrocortisone, right? That's just a, a man-made version of what cortisol does, so it decreases inflammation. So we like to give that to people that have really bad lungs, like COPD that's been exaggerated, or someone with an autoimmune disease that's very inflammatory, like rheumatoid arthritis, we give people cortisone. Or if you have a bad knee or disc or joint, right, we shoot some cortisone in there, reduces inflammation, but we can't do it long term because long term effects of cortisone are not good in the body. It suppresses the immune system, causes um, anxiety, and like we give people prednisone in the hospital and they say, I can't sleep. Well, of course, prednisone causes anxiety. Um, We'll talk more about that. Um, aldosterone is one that helps with fluid balance in the body. It controls sodium levels. So it's important just to know that basic list. So when I ask you a question on the test about how these hormones act in the body, you know if it's a fatty hormone, it's going to act a little differently, and we'll talk about that. <clears throat> so when these hormones are released by the glands, the different endocrine glands, they bind to cells that have receptors for that hormone. So it's not going to influence a cell unless that cell has a receptor that binds to that specific hormone. So we call those cells target cells. So for example, the anterior pituitary secretes the hormone prolactin, which stimulates the cells, the alveolar glands, to produce milk. So the, L, the cells of the alveolar glands, those cells are what have receptors for prolactin. No other body is going to have, or no other cell is going to have receptors for prolactin. So those hormones are going to alter that target cell and make it do something. So that action on that target cell might be to open up or close an ion channel. It might tell that cell to make an enzyme or some other protein. It might activate or deactivate enzymes. It might tell it to secrete something. For example, 
prolactin acting on the cells of the breast, the alveolar glands, it's going to tell those cells to secrete milk. Because remember, prolactin is in charge of milk production, so it's going to tell that cell, start making milk and secreting it into the duct. Or stimulating mitosis. If it's growth hormone binding to muscle and bone in a growing child, it's going to stimulate those cells to divide and get bigger. So it just depends on the hormone and on the cell and what that cell's job is. So for example, um, oh, I just gave you some, we'll just leave it at that. So the amino acid, like I said, are all water soluble. They have to act on plasma membrane receptors because they cannot enter the cell because of that fatty core of the plasma membrane. Remember, it's a phospholipid bilayer. So those, those lipids, that lipid portion of the phospholipid, those two fatty acids create uh, an oily core, and water and oil don't mix. So if you have something like an amino acid hormone, amino acid-based hormone, it can't dissolve through. So it has to bind. Lipid-soluble hormones can run right through, but they act a little differently, that they act on DNA in the nucleus and start some protein synthesis. So they can enter the cell. And we'll talk about why we care about all these very specific details in just a little bit. So this is a lipid-soluble hormone. So this would be anything like estrogen, testosterone, cortisol, aldo you know, aldosterone, all those things I mentioned. So they pass right through. So here's the steroid hormone. The receptor for it is inside the cell. So it's inside the cell. So we still have to have receptors to get the, because we don't want every cell to be turned on by a hormone, right? It has to have a receptor, but it's inside the cell. It binds to that and then causes it to make a protein via stimulating protein synthesis with DNA. So it makes a protein. Some, some maybe this is collagen or keratin stimulating, you know, um, whatever, any protein that this cell needs to make. But it's the steroid hormone that stimulated it. For example, testosterone, we know, helps build up muscle and connective tissue and gives males more bulk. And it gives them a wider jawline. So it might be something related to that if it was, this was testosterone, making extra collagen. So the way these, oh, another example, um, it's not shown here. Do I have the other one? No. The other example is binding to a receptor on the surface and stimulating it. So I don't have a picture of that. But an easy way to remember the difference between these two hormones, it's like one is a drive-up window. You pull up. It's ready to go. You just go to the drive-up window. They pass out what you need, and you move on very quick. But the other type of hormone is like a sit-down restaurant. You enter, you sit down, they go and make it. So which one is this, the one we're looking at here? Would this be a sit-down restaurant or a drive-up window? Is it already made? When this steroid hormone binds is what this cell does. Is it already made and ready to go? No, it has to bind, then it makes the protein. So lipid-based hormones take longer to get the response from that cell because they have to diffuse, bind, activate protein synthesis, and then they make it. Just like when you come and think of it like this. You're sitting down. You're coming into the restaurant, right? Sitting down at a table right here, right? The waitress then takes your order into the kitchen, makes the meal, and then you've got what you need, right? Where the, the amino acid-based um, hormone, you just go right up to the receptor, you bind to the receptor, which is your drive-up window. It's already made in vesicles. So as soon as that receptor binds, the vesicle releases, or you stimulate that target cell, whatever that target cell does, is instantaneous. So which is longer? Which takes longer then to get a response? The lipid soluble. Okay, so how we control hormone levels in the body is through negative feedback. And it's the hypothalamus, which is really boss on controlling hormone levels. 
So if we look at the stimuli, how endocrine, endocrine glands are stimulated, humoral stimulation means there's something in the blood that's changing that is causing that gland to do its job. For example, this first example is an example of that. What's in the blood? It's calcium levels. This is the parathyroid gland that sits around the thyroid. Calcium levels are dropping, so those low calcium levels are detected by the cells of the parathyroid gland, and it releases parathyroid hormone, which we call the bone breaker. Remember, it stimulates osteoclast activity to release calcium to the blood. So this would be calcium levels in the blood. Humoral just means something in the blood that's not a hormone. So calcium levels. The second one is a neural stimulus. This is the adrenal medulla on the inside that secretes epinephrine. So epinephrine is secreted to the blood here, but what stimulates the cells of the adrenal medulla is an action potential from the nervous, from the sympathetic nervous system. So in this case, that's a neural stimulus causing the adrenal medulla to secrete epinephrine. So for here, you could just put in a low calcium is what's in the blood here, and what's released is PTH. So fill that in. Low calcium would go here, and PTH is what's released here. This would be action potential here, and epinephrine is released here. So that's a neural stimulus of the adrenal medulla. And maybe write down what this gland is, right? Underneath it, adrenal medulla. So this one is an adrenal medulla. What gland do we say this is? Parathyroid gland. And these are three different examples because it's the most common. So hormonal stimuli is most common, which means the anterior pituitary releases a hormone that tells these glands, secrete your hormone. So what is the name of the hormone released by the anterior pituitary that stimulates the thyroid here? The parathyroid gland are these little dots here. So the, this is the thyroid gland. The anterior pituitary, if you remember from general A&P, it releases TSH, ACTH, FSH, do you remember those? LH, all of those, that list. So the anterior pituitary releases TSH, so you would put TSH right here. And when TSH binds to the thyroid gland, it stimulates that thyroid to release T4. So T4 is what you should put at the bottom of the arrow there. So TSH is released. T4 is then stimulated to be released from the thyroid gland. This is acting on the adrenal cortex. So the hormone that acts on the adrenal cortex that comes from the anterior pituitary is ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone. ACTH is what you should put here, coming from the anterior pituitary, releases ACTH, and that is like a foreman telling the adrenal cortex to release its hormones, and one of those would be cortisol. We'll just put that down here, cortisol. And then this one is telling the testes to release, what hormone do the testes release? testosterone, so that goes here, and what hormone from the anterior pituitary stimulates testosterone secretion? Do you remember that from general a &P? LH, LH, yep, yeah, LH. So these hormones here, like I said, hormonal stimuli, these are called tropic hormones. So write that down under here, tropic hormones, T-R-O-P-I-C, tropic hormones. Those are hormonal stimuli for other endocrine glands. So I'll just open up a little thing here. Tropic hormones, they are made by the hypothalamus and anterior pituitary glands. Examples are ACTH, LH, FSH, TSH, what are the other ones, I'm just 
trying to find my, there's a picture of this in your textbook if you're wanting to know the anterior pituitary. Um, these are on page 612. Yeah, 612 and 613. So those are all tropic hormones from the anterior pituitary. And then there's a bunch that come from the hypothalamus. But I don't know, a lot of textbooks don't list those. Your textbook does list them on page 611. They are GHR, oops, GHRH, which stands for growth hormone releasing hormone. Then there's growth hormone inhibiting hormone. There's thyroid releasing hormone. Then there's cortisol releasing hormone. Then there's gonadotropin releasing hormone. And then there's prolactin inhibiting hormone. And these all come from the hypothalamus. So these are all what we call tropic hormones. They stimulate other endocrine glands. That's their job, is to stimulate other endocrine glands. I'll make this bigger if this is hard to see in the back of the room. Okay, so hopefully you have a better understanding of what tropic hormones mean and how they just are basically like the boss, the foreman telling the workers what to do. The endocrine glands are the workers. They have their own hormones to secrete, but they don't secrete them unless the boss tells them to, which is the hormones of the anterior pituitary and the specific hormones for these specific glands. All right, so again, they must have receptors in order to bind. And thyroxine, T3, or I'm sorry, T4, those receptors are found on every cell of the body. Because what do we know about thyroid hormone? It controls what? Your thyroid controls what? Metabolism. Yeah, it controls your metabolism. So all cells are conducting, you know, chemical reactions, making ATP, so they're all going to have receptors for thyroid hormone. So how well they're activated, how many cells are activated, and how long they're activated depends on the blood levels of that hormone, right? So that makes sense. And the number of receptors on that target cell. So if there's not very many receptors, they're not going to respond. If there's a lot of receptors, they're really going to respond, right? And then the strength and the binding between that receptor and hormone, the affinity. So those are three things that determine how well that target cell is going to respond. Blood levels, number of receptors, and the strength of, between the receptor and the hormone. So that's when we talk about the number of receptors. There's this concept of upregulation and downregulation. And this is a huge concept to understand when it comes to addictions, because over time, we upregulate. If there's a lot of a receptor available, the brain can upregulate and create lots of receptors. And then what happens when we pull that medicine away? Downregulation. So then we reduce the number of receptors. Or if you have overstimulation, we can have a lack of responsiveness. For example, when we look at obesity and leptin, well, you would expect to see a lot of leptin release, right? If someone has a lot of fat cells, more leptin release. And what do we say leptin does? It's the I'm full hormone, right? It's going to say I'm not hungry hormone. But if we have so much leptin due to excess body fat, the brain down regulates because there's so much of that hormone, they reduce the receptors for it. So as a result, there's not enough leptin stimulation of target cells. So what does it tell the brain then if we're no longer responding to leptin? Instead of I'm full, I'm hungry. So people with more body fat have more 
hunger stimulation because of this down regulation of receptors for leptin. So that's where they talk about, um, you know, like these documentaries online, My 600 Pound Life, right? So a lot of that is not only just um, psychological relationships with food, but there's also a hormonal imbalance on many different levels, but leptin dysregulation is a big one and trying to get through that while, you know, um, body fat goes down. And how many of you know people that are very thin that have very low appetites? And you're like, why don't you eat, right? They just don't care about eating. Some people just um, are very responsive to leptin and their hunger signals aren't there. Some people are overly responsive to leptin. You ever watch that commercial they had years ago about the lion and she opens up the refrigerator and there's like a lion on top of the refrigerator because some people have an overactive hunger stimulus and they just are seeking food. A lot of that is hormone dysregulation. It's not all I'm a rotten person, right? Or I don't care about my weight. We know that there are people that have dys leptin receptor dysfunction and we see that it runs in families. So we have to kind of think about those things and not just judge people that struggle with their weight because sometimes it's just receptor hormone dysregulation. Um, so if you use illegal drugs, things like opioids or like heroin is an opioid, like oxycodone, people start with oxycodone because they had maybe a tooth pulled. They really like the effects of oxycodone. They have uh, a tendency to, to be addicted to whatever, so they end up running out of oxycodone sources, so then someone says, well, here, try this heroin. It's, it's better than oxycodone. And the next thing you know, they're hooked. So what happens then is the body craves more and more, because there's hormone available, right? So they have extra receptors, I'm sorry, reduced receptors, because there's so much of this drug available, so they have reduced receptors, then you take the drug away, and people crash hard, and they have all those withdrawal symptoms. So then we have to give people something to bind those receptors so they don't go deep into withdrawal. And we have something that's called methadone. Have you ever heard of methadone or suboxone? Are two really popular medicines out there that bind to opioid receptors. So they give, they prevent the withdrawal symptoms, but they don't give people the high. So people miss the high, right, because Maybe they're not going into withdrawal because they're taking the Suboxone, but they miss the high. So some people don't, um, aren't satisfied with that. And they don't go into treatment because they miss, it's not even a high, it's actually a low. It's just a really mellow, relaxed low. So that's the problem when you try to treat people is, is they make changes to the brain by exposing themselves to artificial chemicals. And the same thing happens when people are on medicines for anxiety and depression, some people just naturally don't produce enough serotonin, which is a neuro neurotransmitter that makes us feel good. And if it runs in your family, if you look around your family and say, geez, you know, I had a, a relative who was an addict, I had uh, a brother or sister that, you know, committed suicide, or a relative that committed suicide, if you look in your, in your environment and see a lot of people that have you know, mood issues or addictions, then it runs in the family. So if you're one of those people, it doesn't mean that you're not able to cope with life and you're a weak person. It means that maybe just the brain is not secreting enough of that neurotransmitter and a little help with some medicine to secrete the neurotransmitter to boost those levels up is all a person needs. So we really have to, to give ourselves a break and not be afraid of taking medicines sometimes that can help with these imbalances. Now, on the side, other side of that, should we take medicines because we're making bad life choices and we're depressed because we're in a bad relationship, in an abusive relationship, or drinking too much, or smoking a lot of marijuana? So now we're anxious, now we'll just take meds for that for a life? No. What the goal is for people is to boost neurotransmitter levels if they're going through a bad time. So go on medicine temporarily, allow yourself to cope to get through that life situation and then go off those medicines. So sometimes we can induce depression and anxiety with divorce or a major loss, right? Or going into school, it's not uncommon for people to become anxious when they're in college. Um, and it's okay to, to rely on medicines for the short term. But did you know that exercise, 20 minutes of exercise where your heart rate is up and you're breathing a little heavier, not exhausting, not like sucking wind, unable to talk exercise, just moderate levels of exercise, 20 minutes a day, that alone can replace medicine for mild to moderate depression or anxiety. 
So if we just get ourselves moving, especially in college, when you're sitting a lot, right, sitting in class, sitting and studying, um, getting yourself moving can help you deal with anxiety and help you learn better. <clears throat> so upregulation, downregulations are responses to the body of excess hormone or not enough hormone. <clears throat> so if we, if we um, are someone who is very reactive to our environment, have anger issues, and any little trigger gets us going and we release all those hormones, then what's going to happen to the body? We can upregulate receptors to make ourselves more receptive to that, and then that means people trigger faster. So what we try to do with anybody is try, whenever they have phobias or anger issues, is we try to give them low levels of exposure and give them alternative things to do so they don't have that response, to try to get those receptors down so those cells aren't so responsive in the brain. So that's where you know anxiety can be triggered that way too, is upregulation, making extra sensitive cells ready to respond. All right, so hormones, how do, they get how do we get rid of them? Enzymes, we have some enzymes that break them down. The major organs, the amino acid base hormones are, really, are removed by the kidneys, and the steroid fatty hormones are released, ah, removed by the liver. So make sure you know the difference. You should write that down. The kidneys remove amino acid-based hormones, so insulin, glucagon, growth hormone, all those hormones that we haven't mentioned. Those are filtered by the kidneys. The liver is getting rid of all those fatty hormones, the estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. That's the job of that organ. So if someone has kidney or liver disease, it's going to influence the levels of those hormones, depending on what hormones are. So responses are immediate. That would be the amino acid base, because we said that's like a fast food drive up window, right? Those, those target cells have that product, that response, whatever the amino acid-based hormone is, the response from that cell is in vesicles ready to go. So that's what the package, the bag of food is that you get from McDonald's drive-up. That's the response from a target cell that's stimulated by an amino acid-based. Where the steroid hormone, we said that has to diffuse in, it has to bind, has to stimulate protein synthesis. That's the sit-down restaurant. That can take hours to days to get a response. And then how long does the response last? Well, it depends. 10 seconds to several hours. Depends, you know, how quickly it's released to how long it can be in the system before it's broken down. So these are just a nice list. It's a summarizing table that tells you the differences between lipid soluble and water soluble. So these are the fat hormones and these are the amino acid based. So be sure you know that table really well, because I will ask several questions on the test about that. So we talked about the hypothalamus, and that's this part of the brain that interacts with the posterior and anterior pituitary. This is, the an this is the posterior, this is the anterior. Notice that the posterior pituitary is just an extension of the hypothalamus. See these, these neurons that just come down into the posterior pituitary? So the posterior pituitary is made up of nervous tissue, and it secretes two hormones, ADH and oxytocin, only when an action potential stimulates the release into the blood. So it still goes to the blood, those hormones, but not unless the hypothalamus stimulates an action potential to release those hormones. So these hormones are stored in the axon terminals of these neurons from the posterior pituitary. So oxytocin and ADH. And again, axon terminals of neurons from the hypothalamic neurons. So the posterior pituitary is all about axon terminals and neurons. That's all it's made of. It's nervous tissue. So the anterior part has a vascular system called the hypophyseal portal system. The hypophyseal portal system. 
And this is a special blood supply. It's right here, the hypophyseal portal system. It's a special blood supply that goes only from the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary. So for whatever's secreted into this little capillary is only between the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary. That's what a portal system is. It's just a little separate blood supply only between these two organs. So those hormones we listed earlier from the hypothalamus, these here, those are released into the anterior pituitary, depending on what the needs are, and that's going to stimulate the release of these hormones. So these hormones, stimulated, coming down, are released here, coming down through the special portal system, hypophyseal portal system, know that definition, just a capillary bed here, and then it's released to the general blood supply, whatever hormone is needed. So, there's a number of these different anterior pituitary hormones. These are tropic hormones, and what does that mean again? What? They stimulate what? What do the tropic hormones stimulate? No? Well, they are target cells, but where specifically? What? Yeah, other endocrine glands. They, they stimulate other endocrine glands. The growth hormone stimulates bone and muscle, right? Prolactin stimulates breast alveolar glands, so that's not an endocrine gland. That's an exocrine gland, the breast tissue. So these are tropic hormones. So the hypothalamus, so what happens? So let's say we have um, the hypothalamus indicates thyroid levels are low, T4 levels are low. The hypothalamus will secrete TRH, which will tell the anterior pituitary to release TSH, which will tell the thyroid gland to increase T4 release. And then when that goes up, that inhibits TRH, TSH, and slows secretion from the thyroid gland. So the hypothalamus is what's sampling the environment, determining if it's time to secrete more hormone. All right, so the next topic is the reproductive system, so we'll stop.